Hi, podcast listeners. Jean-Philippe Courtois here. You may not be aware, but we are now in season six of the Positive Leadership Podcast. This is actually the 55th episode we have recorded. It's been two years since we started. Yes, two years. And in that time, I've spoken to leaders from all over the world, from Nigeria, India, Belgium, France, United States, CEOs, coaches, entrepreneurs, authors, change makers, as well as specialists in positive psychology and neuroscience. They've been incredibly generous in sharing their success, the mistakes, and key pivotal moments that shape their personal and professional paths. For me, it's been the most amazing learning experience. So I wanted to take this moment to reflect back on some of the authentic stories that have helped me navigate my own positive leadership journey. And I also wanted to tell you more about myself. We've never done a really deep dive into my leadership story and philosophy. So that's what we're going to do today in this special episode. We'll be turning the tables. And to do so, I've invited my friend, my leadership coach, Michael Bungestania, MBS, to interview me. JP, I am so glad to be back in conversation with you. You know, you were so kind enough to invite me to be a guest on your show early on. And congratulations, by the way, on season six and 55 episodes. That's amazing. But we go back beyond the podcast as well, which I know we're going to talk yes. about a little bit as well. But thank you. I'm excited to turn the tables on you. I'm rubbing my hands in glee here. Michael is the author of The Coaching Habit, the best-selling coaching book of this century, and I've been lucky enough to have been personally coached by him in the past. JP, I'm really interested in talking to you because, um, as you say, it's two years since you started the podcast. It's also two years since you stepped away from that really big role, Executive Vice President of Sales and President of Sales in, in Microsoft. And I'm curious to know how your idea of positive leadership has changed and evolved how you've changed as you've moved to this next phase of how you show up and how you serve the world. So I'm excited to dig into some of this. JP, let me ask you this though. Why, how, what, what motivates you to keep going? It's yeah. not like you're not doing anything else. You've got, you, you got your foundation, you've got yeah. other responsibilities. You're a great champion for work across the world. And most podcasts get abandoned after about one or two or three episodes. You're on to 55. <laughs> why, why keep going? Why, not, why don't you just wrap this up and go, look, I, I did my podcasting. <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> my, my work here is done. I'm moving on. I'm, I'm standing up so I can make a run for it. I, I think a couple of reasons, Michael. I found, number one, that in a way I've created this new routine in my life mm. uh, where I'm digesting you know, books, but also mm. conversation they had and trying to absorb completely their universe and who they are, etc. And I love those moments. I love those moments of getting to know someone who was unknown to me or maybe a big name, but not as a person, getting to have this, to create that intimacy and expose and surface some amazing moments of truth, of wisdom and so on, makes me very humble because yeah. I'm never sure when I start an episode that I'm going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and then the more I study all those people and the incredible achievement they had in their lives, the books, everything yeah. they did, the more I understand how little I know about the world. <laughs> so that's humility. I mean, the second thing, obviously, I, I'm nourishing myself by their inspiration and, mm. and, and having such conversations with some, some really wonderful people who propagated positivity despite the digital experience we have because we are never, almost never in the same room physically. I right. take those vibes back to me, to my life. <laughs> and, yeah. and to me, that's inspiration. And, yeah. and the third thing is about growth. Mm. <laughs> because again, as, as I get to have uh, this conversation, those conversations, I'm trying to sharpen a bit my pencil in terms of all, my own leadership kind of capabilities, what I do, and the way I love to evolve. So it's about growing as well. What's the relationship in your mind between humility and growth? I mean, to me, that's a starting point. Mm. It's a starting point. I mean, being humble, having humility in terms of knowing that you know so little about everything in the world, and and then knowing as well, or I would say, being humble enough to uh, you know not take a failure as a uh, as the end of the road, yeah. but being able to to keep 
adding maybe some potential skills or attitudes in the way I behave personally mm. as 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 human body. That to me is is the relationship between humility and, and growth. Let me ask you another question around this. Um, yeah, I mean, people talk about humility, and in my experience it becomes harder the older and the more senior you get <laughs> and you you're you're not old you're you're a you're a delightfully Thank young you. man you're, you're um flattering. <laughs> but you've, you've certainly created seen you've had senior positions and you have status and you have authority i'm wondering what you've had to unlearn to allow greater access to humility i, I think michael I, I got to learn a lot more of that through the work I'm doing with my foundation, to mm. be honest, as well. As I started this uh, foundation called Live for Good about seven years ago now in France, uh, whose mission is to basically uh, unleash the potential of use for more works of life through social entrepreneurships, I realized actually how much of a different posture, how much of a different kind of connection I was suppose and I was able hopefully time after time yeah. to cry with those young people yeah. coming from very different backgrounds and having a sense of humility to start with in terms I'm not here from my senior leadership position talking to you <laughs> I'm here to learn from you yes. about your social entrepreneurship journey your personal mission and why and how hopefully I can help you grow in that journey I, I think it has been helping, a, help me, helping me a lot, honestly, to, 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 to get there as well. So you, you're talking about the diverse backgrounds of the, the young people who are part of your foundation, but you've also got a diverse background. You know, you were born in Algiers, uh, your father was a doctor, you moved to Nice. I'm curious to know how that experience has shaped you. Yeah, that has shaped me uh, in, in, a big way, in a big way, Michael. Uh, I was born in Algeria when Algeria was a part of the French territory. Mm -hmm. But the reality, uh, I left Algeria when I was 18 months old. I was a baby. But my family roots were three generations back in Algeria. As you may know or not, Algeria became a French territory back in 1830, right. so in the 19th century. And for three generations, the Courtois, I've been in Algeria. And so... What I learned through this family foundation, which is so called to who I am, yeah. is, is a couple of things. Number one, just seeing and living alongside my dad as long as he was alive, obviously. He was uh, a young doctor. Actually, he first had to uh, fight during the Second World War. He was just 18 years old. Wow. And he went to the, to the front and he was almost killed, actually. Uh, so it was like a miracle. He recovered and he, he came back to Algeria back in 1945. And then he basically did in four years what should have been six years of medical study to mm -hmm. become a doctor. So he had an incredible hard work ethics, an incredible sense of urgency as well because he had a single mom uh, and uh, he wanted to take care of her mom and he wanted to become this doctor to, so that she could be proud of him, but also he could also take care of the people. I've also seen my mom, who has been the incredible, uh, I would say, loving and caring person in the family, mm -hmm. taking care of the three of us with my two uh, sisters. And as we fled, actually, as we flew back to France overnight, what happened, just for people who understand the context at the time, Algeria became independent in July 1962. So just a few weeks before it became evident that the, co that the country was going to be independent, like many families, more than a million French people had to fly back to, to France. Yeah. To the, and so we did that. We did that leaving everything behind us, a house and everything else. Mm. And basically my, my dad with her aging mom, with a wife or, and the three of us kids, we, all, we went to settle in Nice, yeah. where he basically had to fight literally to be able to open a medical office because we are not welcome at all in France. Right. I mean, it was interesting. But as we are called the Pied Noir, that's the Blackfeet, this is the naming of this community. And, and just seeing and living the, those moments, even though I was a baby and then I grew up, and seeing my dad, my mom, fighting for us, mm. taking care of us, and, and doing that with an incredible resiliency has been, I think, shaping me in a, in a big way since I was very young. How would you say that experience, both 
the the role model that your 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 father and your mother were for you, but also this experience of coming back and needing to you know being an outsider, needing to fight to yeah. reclaim yes. a position, to reclaim authority. I'm curious what the how that's been a gift for you, but also how it's been a burden for you. I mean, in terms of the gift, it's it's pretty obvious, Michael. I always consider, and it's it's obviously more than the case today in my life, that family is my core foundation, mm. my family. The people uh, <laughs> that I are yeah, part of that family, and of course. And and to me, that extends as well to a sense of community, belonging to a community of people. And at the time, I could see when the community of Pied Noir was back in France, was not welcome, we were helping each other mm. very much as they had nothing left, actually, right. to start feeding their families, to take care of themselves. And that, that really got me to understand the power of community, yeah. the power and the sense of belonging. So to me, that's been a gift. And also seeing the moral values of my parents I talked about very yeah. much. Has it been a burden? Because you use that world. It's a big world. Yes. Well, I could tell you, I, I was not welcome myself in the school when I was a kid. I remember that mm. because when I was five, six years old, at least this is when I could remember my memories. Again, the other kids from my school in Nice were looking at me as a, as a foreigner, basically. Yeah. It was pretty tough. And I remember actually one day where one of those kids, you know, in the school told me, get out of here. And I was, I was both very sad and I came back home and my dad said, no. You should be very proud of where you come from. Mm. <laughs> and you've got a lot to help them with to understand yeah. the richness of that kind of diversity coming from France from outside into the core fabrics of the country. So yeah. it was a pretty important moment as, as a kid. The people who've been on your podcast, you've had so many interesting guests show up. Um, and I know that one of the things that you're always curious about with your guests is also kind of what their roots are. Um, and how that shaped them. I'm wondering if there's um, any guests that come to mind in particular where you're like, this was a great story. You could really see where they, you know, the soil they were planted in, where they began and how that has turned them into the, the, the person that they are today. Yeah, I, love, I always love those stories, Michael, to try to, to capture, get them as well, understand the, the roots of the people. I think one coming to my mind, which is a recent podcast I did with Melody Upson. Melody mm. uh, is the co-CEO of an investment firm called Ariel Investment today. She's also, she's been actually for a long time, the only chairwoman of, of an American company, Starbucks. Okay, the only African-American mm -hmm. woman, I should say, African-American woman. Okay, so it's a big deal. And, and Melody shared with me, you know, the, the child which she had, she was actually the latest kid of six siblings educated by a single mom and a single mom who had literally, of course, to, to fight for survival, <laughs> to, to provide yeah. for the kids and the family. And Melody being the last kid, of course, in a family also, had in a way to grow up much more rapidly, much more mature, much more sensibly. And she also shared with me and our listeners how much she internalized the power of the money, the power of taking right. care financially of your family and yourself. I had a lot of chaos in my life. We would get evicted, our phone would get disconnected, our lights would be turned off. Sometimes we'd live in an abandoned building. And so as a result of that, I was desperate to understand money. I wanted to understand how it worked. It wasn't about how much I would have. I wanted to live a comfortable, secure life. So financial services, I told people mm. my calling and my purpose in life was born out of my circumstance. And so very early on, Melody, got this sense of urgency on financial literacy. And in a way, that's been a crucible moment. And this is the reason why, a few years after, and she graduated from Princeton University, she joined that firm and she's been working there for more than 30 years. And she's helping out African-American owners of businesses to, uh, to drive their business now in the US and globally. In 2020, in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd, I think in response to Jamie Dimon, a CEO of JP Morgan, you came up with a very special plan called the Project Black. Tell us more about where and how you shaped the plan, where, the, where this idea came about the plan, and what are you going to do with that investment? Yeah, so during the civil unrest that was occurring in our country, the summer of the murder of George Floyd, the vicious murder, 
Jamie called me. I'm on the board of JP Morgan. And he said, you know, Melody, a lot of people want to help black business. And he was toying with some ideas of bringing together black investment firms like mine. And he said, you yeah. know, Ariel could be a part of this. And he started naming firms. And I kept saying, no, mm. Jamie, that firm's out of business. They're gone. Nope, don't exist. And it made the point of where we were as a society. So I said, yeah. how do we create a world in which we can bring capital and customers together to scale mm. change in our society around black and brown businesses and therefore help narrow the wealth gap that exists in this country, in America specifically? Because 95% of minority businesses, that's businesses run by black or has yep. Hispanic uh, leaders, yep. those businesses have less than $5 million in revenues, wow. 95%. Wow. So I said, what if we create an opportunity for black these black and brown businesses to be scaled, to be tier mm. one suppliers? Because the problem that we have is that if you have 95% of these businesses have less than $5 million in revenues, they're not yep. big enough to do business with the giant. So the idea would be that we would go and buy these businesses that mm. may not be black or brown when we buy them, businesses with, with between $100 million and a $1 billion in revenue, where we install at the C-suite level at least one black or brown leader mm. who's CEO, CFO, COO, and when at all possible, where there is opportunity for growth of expansion of those businesses to do so in disadvantaged minority communities. So again, to bring the opportunity to communities, and again, mm. from that perspective, help ne narrow the wealth gap in this country. I think you just caused $1.4 billion, right? From 1.45. 1.45, sorry, let's be precise, sorry. And very sizable. I love the, the way you think about not just access to capital, but actually also to people leadership, changing the mindset and the types of leadership we have in companies and customers. At the end of the day, it's about selling, driving also that supply chain you know, at a much higher scale. That's amazing. You know, you talk about that drive for the importance of money and how that, that early experience can shape you. And, um, and we hear that story about Melody. You know, one of the other core drivers we either have it, or we don't have it, we're hungry for it, is around happiness and around love. Mm. I want to hear about whether there's a guest um, that comes to mind who has an experience of kind of how their, how their story has shaped their experience around thinking about happiness and love. But I'm, I want to ask you about that first. Yeah. What's the role of love mm. in your life and, and also how you see it perhaps now through the lens of positive leadership? Well, that's such a big, deep question, Michael. <laughs> and, and I must tell you that that podcast uh, helped me understand that love goes far beyond the definition I used to have for love. Okay, I used to have, mm. I guess, the definition that most of us have, um, such as, okay, think about loving my wife, my, my partner. I'm loving mm. my kids, obviously, you know, my core family. But actually yeah. what I found out, and I found that also in my life, you can love foreigners in the street. You can love people you didn't yeah. get to know before, like some of the guests on my podcast. And you can, <laughs> you can have those moments of micro love, if I, if, I, if I may call them this way, happening even yeah. a matter of a few minutes of something happening to you or because of someone you are interacting with, doing something with or supporting with that really creates this moment of love. And, and this is Nothing. something I've been enjoying a lot through my foundation in particular, not only, of course, but even yes. in a way I'm provoking a lot more these days, meeting with a lot of people I never got to know before. So kind of broadening mm. my circles of very different type personalities and people. And I, and I would tell you in my podcast, because you also asked me about, ooh, maybe, I mean, I had many examples. Yeah. A great one really uh, was my last one, a French lady called Perla servan schreiber I'm sorry because it's in French. For many of you, you may not be able to, to catch the episode. But Perla is 80 years old today, and she's the youngest positive leader I can ever see, I've ever met with. She, <laughs> she, used, to be the, she used to be the head of a, of a very famous magazine in France, actually positive psychology by accident, okay? Oh, yeah, there we go. And, and she's been someone who had to endure some you know, pretty tough, tragedies, including uh, the, the loss of her husband during COVID, actually recently a well-known person in France as well. And the way she's talking about her moments of joy, the way she creates joys and happiness in her life, doing cooking, doing some blogs today, yes, blogs, 
writing books like you, Michael. She's writing books every six months. It's like incredible. <laughs> uh, and sharing your wisdom about the way you can nurture joy in your life mm. at 80 years old and beyond was an amazing moment for me of, of gratitude in terms of learning from someone who, who's gone, you know, and, and, and do so much actually in our life. That's fantastic. JP, you, you shared a little bit about that experience growing up. But one of the things that I think is extraordinary about you and unusual really is just how long a career you've had at Microsoft. You started back in the 80s, uh, right at the beginning of the kind of the PC industry, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know how much revenue Microsoft was making back there, but it was like a buck 95. And, uh, you know, and it's now, you know, a multi trillion dollar company. So you've really um, grown through the organization as the organization's grown, you've grown and evolved and changed. What were you like when you first joined Microsoft? What were you like as a leader? When John Microsoft back in 1984 was right. May the 2nd, exactly, I can have that in my mind because May 1st is holidays in French. That's the that's, that's right. a Labor Day, of right? Like is, many yeah. countries. <laughs> and so my first day, I show up in Les Ulysses, a very small suburb in an industrial area of Paris. And I, and you have to remember, I was coming from Nice. So I was the, the guy coming from the south to, to, the, to the big center of the, of the country. So I was right. like, wow, OK. And we were less than a thousand people globally. Wow. Uh, so a really small company. And I love that. I thought that in a startup company, I could prove myself more than a very established companies where I would enter as a da 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 and, and hopefully do something of my professional life. And yeah. actually at the time I was super charged. I mean, as, 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 a, as a young manager, meaning I was incredibly high intensity, highly demanding on people, yeah. but certainly also highly accountable. I've always believed that, hey, I'm the one being accountable and when I'm being asked to do something, right. I'm going to commit like hardcore to do the best of, and really delivering on expectation. So right. in many ways, high bar, asking people to do more what they could do all the time yeah. and driving them super hard in the details of the business, micromanaging the business. Right. Because uh, of course I thought I was very smart and I could do all of that. <laughs> so that was the young JP in a way. Yeah. <laughs> 39 years later, you could say fast forward now. <laughs> I realize, of course, that I'm here actually to get others to grow and flourish mm. so that they can really deliver the best impact that our company would love to have in respect of the countries and the world we're operating as a global company. Yeah. And, and that got me to reflect and change a lot of my leadership attitudes or ways of dealing with people and even the way I was spending my time on growing and developing people as opposed to finding the solution for all those people. Yeah. The other thing has been also a lot about, uh, in a way, having a much more direct connection to the impact that each one of the persons can have in their professional and personal lives. So in a way, connecting with the people, the way the work they do is meaningful to them in their own development, but also bring a positive impact in what we can achieve with our company organization. So really connecting the two, the company's kind of mission and organization, you know, undertaking and the person on development right here, right now. That's a pretty radical shift. Um, and in fact, you could, you could look at Microsoft overall and its culture and kind of go, actually, it feels like the culture and Microsoft has undergone something of a radical shift like that because, you know, it had a reputation back in the day of being a pretty driven, pretty micromanager, pretty yes. my, make, get the results and make them harder. And like, sounds like you, part of your success was you embodied that culture. Yes. Um, and then over the last decade or so, there's been a shift of culture, you know, from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. That's easy to talk about in theory, but in practice, it's a big thing to, to unlearn and relearn as a leader, in part because you are giving, you're learning how to give up control and status. Yes. What was that journey like for you? Well, the journey was uh, both exciting and also uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Both. It was really both, actually. Exciting because at the time it was back in 2015 when mm. I was basically in charge of transforming the anti Salesforce of Microsoft to move from being a, one of the best, honestly, software Salesforce in the world, selling licensing contracts to a bunch of customers, which we love to do, yeah. as sellers, 
and transforming all those 35,000 people in becoming trusted advisors to every organization on the planet to become digital companies, digital mm. organizations. Wow, that's a gigantic shift in it terms, is. not just of hard skills, but actually also in terms of soft skills. Yeah. And so what I found out at the time, because starting with myself, I had to learn a bunch of new things in terms of technology, in terms of industry skills, business skills. But probably the place where I spent the most of my time was to undo the JP of the older days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and when I started that job, first decision I took was to kill a legendary process within a company called Media Review. And for all Microsoft guys, maybe some of them listening on the podcast, they <laughs> they're, know what they're I'm talking They're weeping. About. They're weeping in a corner it, somewhere. <laughs> it, 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 was an, it was an incredible process where for two months in a row, yeah. we are locked into rooms reviewing literally every single business, every single subsidiary in the world, every company in the world for Microsoft and drilling down on thousands of numbers mm. and managing the details like crazy and driving with intention a lot of performance management and more. It was incredible. Uh, a lot of learning, but a lot of waste in the process yeah. in terms of people ability to do more by themselves. So I killed that process which was my first decision. But then I, I say, well, it's not enough. I also need to show up differently. And that was part also of my own development as an apprentice coach, as you know well. And I picked, I picked of course, the, the best coach in the world, MBS, this MBS I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, thank you. You may, you may be overselling me a little bit there, but I'll, I'll take it. Thank you, JP. Michael Mugistania's book, The Coaching Habit, was a huge influence on me at the time. In fact, I became something of an apprentice to Michael because I've been applying actually, uh, you know, the core principle of the coaching habits, not just through Microsoft, Microsoft doing that across and at scale with 30,000 people, but also doing the same with my foundation. And I'm such a strong believer that the coaching habits are part to me of the positive leadership, basically arsenal of the skills that a positive mindset needs to develop to grow others so, so that they can have a positive impact in the world. The tipping point for me personally and for the sales force at Microsoft came when I found myself being coached by Michael live on stage in front of 3,000 sales managers at the Microsoft sales event, a moment we captured in episode 11. And you and I were on stage <laughs> on a very humbling I remember coaching well. discussion. <laughs> and what happened at the time, you basically did with me what I was trying to do with all the managers and all of our people across Microsoft is to show a new yeah. way of grow growing others by becoming a lot more curious, by becoming lazy and often. <laughs> and of course, people who want That's to understand right. all of that, need to read your books <laughs> and check your videos. But it was a wonderful moment where I was intimidated, I was worried, <laughs> I was showing how much I was scrambling on stage. And at the end of that session, I got so many notes from hundreds of people around the world saying, JP, I'm in. I'm in the game. I want to become a coach myself, and I want to transform the way I'm showing up and the way I'm going to help our customers and people across the world. That was such a crucible in my professional and personal life, Michael. Thank you for that. My pleasure. You know, you embodied a, a, a vulnerability, which, you know, is such an, a powerful act of leadership. Because I still remember the conversation. It kind of went from how do I help, how do I get my people to do this stuff? Yeah. And it shifted to how do I, 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 these are my words, not your words, but basically how do I learn to give up some of this control and trust my people? Yes. And that statement that you could feel it ripple across the audience in the, in yeah. the hall and then beyond the hall as well. So it was, it still gives me goosebumps thinking about it, JP. <laughs> and I, I was you know, really honored to be part of that with you. So thank you. In a podcast and with positive leadership, one of the recurring themes is a sense of purpose. After talking to so many articular leaders and reading so many books on the subject, I know that my purpose is about having a positive impact on people and the planet. And to leave this, I focus on growth and learning. Learning from the people that have vital desire to make a positive impact in the world. And contributing to people through coaching from the youngest social entrepreneurs in my foundation to the largest enterprise in the world. 
Has there been a guest on the podcast that's helped shape and kind of help you stay connected to the sense of purpose? In a way, I'm in discussion, of course, with my kind of boss and manager or CEO chairman, Satya Nadella. Mm-hmm. I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you heard. When we had an episode with Satya more than a year ago now, and he, he was making a, a comment about the job that we have right here, right now in our lives, whatever, whoever we are. And he said, don't wait for the next job to, to bring the very best of yourself. And I, and I strongly believe in that, which is, in a way, that job that you decide to pick, and I know that for some people, they don't decide necessarily to pick their job, so I'd have to, to put that, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that restriction as well. For, but for all of us who can actually pick a job, uh, wow, this has to be meaningful in our lives because right. this has to contribute to something bigger than ourselves and fulfill not just ourselves, but others. You know, Satya, I, I remember actually really well your very first speech as a CEO uh, when you said something that really stuck with me. You said, I want us to all the employees, by the way, all the employees were listening, watching, or some of them in alignment. I want us to find meaning in our work. And you articulated at the time our new mission as a company, succeeding, of course, to our founder's mission. So why do you think it's so important for companies to have a purpose beyond only making profit and money, which is expected from, from companies in the first place. Why is that so important? Yeah, I mean, there are two threads, uh, Jean-Philippe, for me in, in that entire uh, piece. I mean, for the two of us who have grown up essentially through our entire professional career uh, at Microsoft, uh, I felt that there was a reason why I stayed, you stayed, there was a, there was, I, I felt that Microsoft represented in its essence something that caused me to commit. I wanted to invoke that at scale. So in some sense, you know, it was just not by accident that whatever 25 years of my life had gone through and I was still at Microsoft. And so I said, why is that? And it is because of that sense of purpose and mission of the company that I identified with. Uh, yeah. I always, you know, we used to, at least when I joined, uh, which was after you had joined, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we used to talk about our mission as a PC in every home and every desk. And yep. the reality is by even the end of the 90s, at least in the developed world, we had more or less achieved that mission. I felt we right. kind of kind of were a little lost and we went on this journey. What is our mission then? Uh, and then when as I reflected on it, the reality is it dawned on me that that was an audacious goal, right? When it was hmm. first uttered, but it was not the mission, the sense of purpose. In fact, I go back all the way to the founding of the company because the idea behind Microsoft and saying, oh, we'll create a basic interpreter for the Altair yeah. is <laughs> about helping others, empowering others to build more technology. And uh, so I wanted to invoke that in whatever reinvention I knew will come, only if we invoke a sense of mission, purpose, and pride, uh, which got someone like me to stay in the company all those years. When Satya Joel Max of many years ago, being a CEO was not even a thought in his long-term career plan. Instead, he was focused on excelling the role he had at the time. One of the key takeaways from that episode was, Reframe your job to be the most important thing you could be doing at any given time and get satisfaction out of it. Do your best work now. So your foundation is called Live for Good. And I know that in, in many ways you're taking 40 plus years of experience and wisdom and going, can I give this to young social entrepreneurs right from the start to try and accelerate them into wisdom and ambition and courage and impact and changing the world for good? What are you trying to teach them? What I'm trying to teach them, Michael, is actually the potential of their positive leadership is inside them. Mm. The, my, my key areas of focus for good is really to unleash those hidden powers of positive leadership. And as you know well, I mean, those powers are revolving around three ripples. We call it ripples in positive psychology so that they can truly understand who they are. 
they can become self-aware, which is so hard. Yeah. They can actually, with the help of others, understanding their strengths. Then, then we go and we unleash with them the power of positive communication. Because in those roles, you have to convince tons yeah. of stakeholders who, you know, and, and you have no money to invest like a large company would have. <laughs> the, it will be the power of your worlds and the power of your of your inspiration. And then the yeah. third ripple is me, them, and the world. And the way they are building the change mm. by building an impact startup company in the world. So that's what they're trying to achieve. And it's a, a nurturing journey, <laughs> which I love to be along. They're just doing the, the, the problem itself, which is a nine months problem, but actually year after year, to see them growing, to see them sometimes failing, rebouncing back. It's amazing because some of them I'll know, yeah. um, I've been actually acknowledged as among be. the top positive leaders in the country. Just last year, I got five of them out of the top 15, which I found pretty amazing. <laughs> and, I'm amazing. So, I'm so, and I'm so proud of them. <laughs> so amazing. proud of them it's to see the way they are leading, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a podcaster myself, so I'm, I'm curious to know, what's the experience been for you in terms of creating and hosting this new podcast? I mean, first of all, I decided to get into the podcast without knowing exactly what it takes <laughs> to do podcasts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's actually hard work first, hard mm. work to create that intimacy, that trust as well with someone you don't necessarily know, mm. <laughs> to give the best kind of wisdom, nuggets of knowledge that she or he has developed along the years. How do you accelerate intimacy, trust, and vulnerability? Because that's a useful gift to have as a podcast host. It's a useful gift to have as a leader. So what have you learned around more quickly accelerating that kind of connection? Coming up and start a session with some positive energy. So right. people see that I'm into it. To listen up, to really listen deeply as much as I can. Right. And with the tone of my voice, hopefully, try to give them a sense of confidence that they're in good hands. They're yes. in positive hands, I would say, in positive hands. Someone is really trying to, mm. to bring the best about themselves and give the opportunity to have this conversation with me. I love that. You know, with free-form discussion as much as we can. You know, one of my mantras and lessons around leading and facilitating and coaching is to be the strongest signal in the room because people respond to the strongest signal in the room, just mirror neurons in people's brains. Yes. So I'm like, how do I embody the experience and the energy I want me and them and the room to have? So if I'm trying to um, encourage vulnerability and intimacy, I'm like, how do I you know, soften my own heart and, and open my own eyes and space so that I can invite that in? I decided to do this podcast as well, Michael, and I, I found actually a lot of joy doing it to apply the learning myself, hopefully. So I'm trying as well to capture in flight and after the flight, <laughs> some, some key nuggets of wisdom, some key foundations of what a positive leader is all about. And of course, it's embodied by very different people, by definition, which I love the diversity of the people and the profiles. And then really picking a few of that and trying explicitly myself, not to mirror what they did, but to reflect on what they did and oh, yeah. could I do some of that myself in my own life? I love that. It's an act of nourishment and discipline and learning and growth right. for you. I see that. Yes, yes. JP, this has been such a rich conversation, hearing about your roots, understanding some of your leadership journey through Microsoft, understanding how uh, embodied by this podcast, but in general, how you've wrestled with this idea of what does positive leadership mean and look like and how do I role model that? I'm wondering in this conversation between you and me, what needs to be said that hasn't yet been said? I think if I'm getting much clearer about my purpose today, if I'm getting much more intentional about where I want to spend my time and the way I want to have that positive impact, it is thanks to my son, Gabriel. Gabriel passed away eight years ago. And basically, he left me and my family with an incredible legacy. And I've got this card that I'm still using in a foundation coming from Gabriel. By the way, the name Live for Good yes. comes from Gabriel himself. He created a website to raise some money for humanitarian actions when he was 18 years old. And one day, he sent me this message, Dad, I have this vital desire to positively change other people's lives. And so 
that has been the, the driving force is my son and, and the way he's been clarifying for me the things that most matter in my life. I see that. And we with my family, it's not me, it's my family. My two daughters and my wife decided a few months after he left us to basically bring mm. the family together uh, towards this new horizon called Live for Good. In a way, redefining some form of family identity yeah. on the core values that Gabriel left us with and with the desire to live mm. some moments of joy together at the moment. So it didn't seem available. No, completely. And so creating that perspective, I mean, it was survival, number one, <laughs> but it was also incredibly mm. shaping in terms of the way we could, all of us, think about the future in a positive way. If you've been enjoying Positive Leadership, please don't forget to like. Comment and share the podcast. It helps other people hear about it as well. And if you like more practical tips and advice on how to build your leadership practice, then head over to my LinkedIn page and sign up for free monthly newsletter, Positive Leadership and You. I'm Jean-Philippe Courtois. I'll be back next week with another inspiring conversation with a purpose-led leader. Until then, thanks so much for listening and goodbye.